Welcome, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. We're glad you could be here with us during this joyous holiday season. During the holidays, young and old alike are drawn to the many symbols of the season: music, celebration, and of course, presents. It is the time for jingle bells, and holly wreaths, and cosy wood fires. All of these are a part of the special warmth we share during the cold and dark winter months. But perhaps the most fascinating and meaningful of all our holiday customs are the stories, tales of heroes and kings, of Christmas elves and toys. Some stories are special, but they are told every year, year after year, from the ancient story book of the sky. On clear winter evenings, after twilight has faded, the stars sparkle brightly overhead. One of the first celestial sights you may notice when you look up is the moon. Some evenings, it appears as a brilliant thin crescent hovering just over the treetops in the west. As it orbits the Earth, the moon changes its shape nightly while drifting slowly eastward among the stars, from crescent through first quarter to full. The full moon is opposite the sun in the sky. Soon. The moon won't rise until early in the morning, leaving the evening sky dark and filled with stars for us to enjoy. The winter season plays host to some of the brightest stars and constellations of the whole year. Constellations are star patterns. There are 88 official constellations astronomers use today to map out the heavens. Our ancestors invented most of them in ancient times, while playing a cosmic game of connect the dots. They created fanciful pictures among the stars to illustrate legendary stories of heroes and princesses, mythological figures, and bizarre wild creatures. It takes some imagination to see these pictures in the stars. You can practice by creating your very own. Try finding three bright stars in the shape of a triangle. Now see if you can find a W. Or how about a V shape? Wonderful. Now I am going to show you one that I know. It's called the Great Square of Pegasus, the Flying Horse. Pegasus is flying upside down in our sky, and the Great Square represents his body. Stars nearby symbolize his neck, head, and legs. Pegasus shares the bright star Alpha Rat. With another constellation, Andromeda, the Fair Maiden. In a story of bravery and romance, Perseus saved her from a hungry sea monster. Andromeda looks like another V shape, only this one is long and narrow. Alpharat represents Andromeda's head, and her long, slender body. Follows the V down to her feet. About halfway up towards her head, and off to the side, is the faint glow of more than two hundred billion stars. 
the Great Andromeda Galaxy. Somewhat larger than our own Milky Way, it is the nearest spiral galaxy to us. Gazing at Andromeda is almost like looking in a mirror, with its spiral arms, dark dust lanes, and enormous core of very old stars. The Andromeda Galaxy is so far away that its light has been travelling toward us for over two million years. Children who might live there would see us as a tiny faint smudge in their night sky. To us, the Milky Way looks like a hazy band of light arching high overhead from the southeast to the northwest. If you look carefully at the stars scattered all across the sky, you'll notice their many colours. Some are red, some are blue, and some are white. One of the reddest stars in the sky is Aldebaran, over here in the constellation of Taurus, the bull. Aldebaran marks his fiery red eye. Like any ordinary bull, Taurus has long pointy horns. We already saw this small V-shape. It's a cluster of stars called the Hyades, and it represents the bull's face. Over near Taurus's shoulder is a tiny cluster of bright bluish stars called the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters, that shimmer and twinkle in the cold, wintry air. If you look closely, you can see five or six stars there, all huddled together as if to keep warm. If you have really good eyesight, you might see the faint flicker of a seventh star. And by peering through a pair of binoculars, you can see dozens of stars sparkling like jewels. Photographs can capture the faint blue wisps of gas and dust left over from their formation only a few million years ago. Above the horns of Taurus is Capella, the brightest star of Auriga, the charioteer. To our eyes, Capella looks like a single bright star, but it's really a system of four stars arranged in two orbiting binary pairs. Most stars have families, like Capella does, but even the closest stars are so far away that our unaided eyes can see only a single point of light. Toward the east is a different kind of star pair that your eyes can see. Castor and Pollux do not orbit each other, but they are linked by the bonds of brotherhood. These two stars represent the heads of the Gemini twins. Their bodies stand side by side atop the Milky Way and are outlined by two faint rows of stars. In Greek mythology, they were the patrons of sailors. They are also the namesake of the early Gemini space missions, which carried a pair of astronauts into orbit. Nearby is Procyon, one of the stars in Canis Minor the little dog. And below him is Canis Major, the great dog, which includes Sirius, the brightest star in the entire night sky. Canis Major is nipping at the heels of Orion, the hunter. Sometimes referred to simply as the great one, Orion's distinctive outline is marked by the bright stars Betelgeuse and Bellatrix, which form his shoulders, and Rigel and Safe, which form his ankle and knee. 
Three stars in a row trace out his belt, and hanging from it is his sword. If you look carefully at the sword region, you may notice that the stars there are glowing as in a fog. These stars really are wrapped in a thick cloud of gas and dust called the Great Orion Nebula. You can just make it out with your unaided eyes. If you aim your binoculars or small telescope there, you will see magnificent streamers and countless stars surrounding the cloud. Even more newly born stars are hidden from view deep within. Using specially designed instruments like the Hubble Space Telescope, astronomers have peered into the heart of this cloud with amazing clarity, revealing young stars and brand new baby solar systems. This gigantic nebula is a star nursery and may someday produce a star with a planetary system like our own. Some nights, while watching the sky, you may notice a bright star that was not there a week or two earlier. This newcomer to the night sky is probably a planet. As planets orbit the sun, they wander through the night sky over weeks and months. Their motion is very slow and fortunately for us, predictable. Just as bright, or even brighter, are satellites which pass overhead quite regularly. Exactly like that bright dot I see moving up there right now. But I thought there weren't supposed to be any satellites visible until tomorrow night. Wait a minute. No, it couldn't be. Could it? Yes, the winter sky is also the backdrop for that most famous hero of all. Dashing through the sky, Santa makes his rounds every Christmas, delivering presents to boys and girls all over the world. In a single magical night, he circles the globe. But on one special Christmas Eve, something very peculiar happened, which interrupted Santa's scheduled deliveries. It was the night that an alien stole Christmas. It was the night before Christmas, when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes that Saint Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled, all snug in their beds, while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below when what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh, an eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver, so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be Saint Nick. More rapid than eagles, his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. No, Dasher! Now, Dancer, now, Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donder and Blitzen, to the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. 
as dry leaves before the wild hurricane fly. When they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So, up to the housetop, the coursers they flew, with the sleigh full of toys, and Saint Nicholas too. But then, in a twinkling, I saw in the air a new thing that made both Saint Nick and me stare. An odd little craft that was shiny and clean had appeared out of nowhere and entered the scene. It headed for Santa and flew ever nearer. As it drew closer, the shape became clearer. Saint Nick rubbed his eyes, but there could be no doubt that a real flying saucer was hovering about. Poor Santa was puzzled, for he knew all the time that there was no spaceship in this Christmas rhyme. He gave out a whistle for his deer to take flight. Either he or this saucer had picked the wrong night. The sleigh with dear Santa was not airborne yet. When the saucer's door opened and out popped a net. And just as his sleigh slipped off the last shingle, the net dropped right down and snatched our Kris Kringle. In the blink of an eye, the net pulled him inside, and the reindeer flew on without their old guide. Inside of the saucer, Saint Nick met his captor. And though he tried not to, he burst out in laughter. Ho ho ho! Before Santa stood quite a strange little fellow. His skin was all green and his eyes were bright yellow. I'm surprised that you laugh, said the little green man. You too would look funny in my native land. I'm sorry, dear sir, for laughing that way. But please tell me why I was snatched from my sleigh. For it's now Christmas Eve, and I must take these toys and deliver them straight to the good girls and boys. On my distant world, I'm called Mr. Freak. And tonight, you and I have appointments to keep. Your love of good children is known far and wide, from Mercury's craters to Pluto's far side. All the planets have kids who wait for this night. They crawl into bed and they close their eyes tight. But on Christmas morning, they rise with no mirth, because all of your presents go to children on Earth. So we'll go to the planets and see those you have missed, and maybe next year they'll appear on your list. With a whoosh and a zoom that was really quite fun, Mr. Freep and Saint Nick headed straight for the sun. That burning gas ball started Santa to worry. He hoped Mr. Freep would change course in a hurry. And just when it looked like the two would be toast, Mr. Freep turned his ship and then slowed to a coast. The small planet Mercury appeared on their screen. Now this was a sight Santa never had seen. Mercury's the planet that is nearest the sun, and being so close makes its weather no fun. In the day, it's so hot it could melt a lead pipe, but at night it's so cold even a snowman would gripe. The kids of this world are made of hard granite. With weather this bad, how else could they stand it? Though the kids on Mercury are accustomed to heat, a 
asbestos sneakers could protect their hot feet. But when night time comes, they could use different gear, like a big fuzzy earmuff to cover their ear. My friend, I am glad I have met you this night, for seeing these children has been a delight. I am happy you found me and brought me out here. Are there any more kids who are in need of good cheer? If there are, I must know, for my job won't be done till they each get a gift. Yes, every one. And so off they went on a Christmas Eve quest. It was the kind of adventure that Saint Nick liked the best. As they travelled along through the darkness of space, the next planet popped up in just the right place. Unlike the last planet, the new one appeared to have some kind of air that was hazy and weird. Do some children live here? It looks strange altogether. Santa wondered out loud if they have nasty weather. I say, Mr. Freak, those clouds are a sight. Do they make rain or snow? They appear very bright. That is Venus, you see, but those clouds are all dry and so nothing wet falls from its hot, cloudy sky. There's a much wetter place you can see over there. It's your home planet Earth that's so blue and so fair. There are very few places with oceans and lakes. To have water like that, Earth has just what it takes. What a treat to see this! What a wonderful view! My home planet, Earth, is so wonderfully blue. But now what do I see as I gaze up ahead? It's another round thing, and it seems to be red. It's a planet, I think, but it's so small and dry that I doubt any snow will fall out of its sky. I see no water there. Is there nothing to drink? Don't the kids who live there wash their hands in a sink? That small planet is dry and it's covered in dust. There's no water there, but there's plenty of rust. That old planet is cracked and it's covered with scars. By the people of Earth, that strange place is called Mars. Just then, a soft glow made their eyes open wide. A silvery shape had appeared just outside. Oh, look, dear Saint Nick, at that thing over there. Why, it looks just like you with your long flowing hair. Ho ho! laughed Saint Nick. It's a comet, I know. I named my fifth reindeer after one long ago. It's a very nice sight and I wish we could stay. But we must hurry on, so let's be on our way. As they sped on along, they soon came to a place where rocks of all sizes were tumbling through space. But the asteroid belt didn't slow them at all. They just hurried ahead to their next port of call. The way was now clear. The last rock was past, when Freep aimed his ship at a target quite vast. So far, every planet had been rocky and small, but Jupiter, the next one, was a giant gas ball. Of all your planets, this one's largest by far. But there's no solid surface for roller skates or toy cars. The kids who live here, who are called billions, 
float through Jupiter's clouds like living balloons. For playing checkers and those kinds of things, billions could use tables and chairs that have wings. Well, Santa agreed with what Freep had to say, so they fired up their engines and then flew on their way. The other gas giants they saw one by one in the darkness of space very far from the sun. They sailed out to Saturn with its glimmering rings, where Santa would send lots of gifts and nice things. The chilly green worlds of Uranus and Neptune had their own needy children. Santa promised to help soon. There's just one more world, and Pluto's a doozy. But I warn you, don't move there if you're feeling too choosy. From the sun, it's the farthest. In fact, it's so far. From the surface of Pluto, the sun looks like a star. Out here, it's so cold, even air would soon freeze. So the ice people of Pluto must chew what they breathe. It is not only cold in the sun's tiny spark. It takes gigantic eyes to see well in the dark. Ho ho ho! Santa laughed. I know just what they need. I'll make storybooks with lights that'll help them to read. But then Santa stopped with a frown on his face. I would never survive a night in this place. My reindeer would freeze, and my eyes could not see. There's no planet but Earth that is just right for me. All these good children deserve presents and fun. But what puzzles me now is how to get this job done. Well, he thought for a while. And he started to giggle. His round tummy shook, and both his ears wiggled. We need Christmas magic. There's no time to pause, and only I can do it, 'cause I'm Santa Claus. To get them all presents, I cannot work alone. So on this Christmas Eve, they'll get Santas of their own. The ice people of Pluto got a Santa like them, with an icicle sleigh and eight skinkles to pull him. The floaters of Jupiter got a Santa to match. He brought presents with parachutes for young floaters to catch. The two left a Santa on each planet they passed. When they finally reached Mercury, they were down to their last. On this strange little planet of great heat and great cold, I will leave them two Santas to split up the load. We thank you, dear Santa, for the gifts of this night. We knew you'd come through and set this thing right. The whole solar system will have Yuletide cheer. But not those on Earth if we keep standing here. You were right. We must hurry. There is no time to wait. The sun will soon rise, and you'll be too late. The children of Earth will soon open their eyes. So hang on, and we'll see how this thing really flies. Next thing he knew, Santa landed with an oomph. He was plopped in his sleigh on that very same roof. Saint Nick shook his head. Did his trip never happen? Had he just gone to sleep? Was he sitting there napping? But when he gazed up in the frosty moonlight, he doubted no more the events of this night. 
for among the bright stars of the broad Milky Way, he saw a small saucer flying quickly away. And then a great smile spread across his round face as he watched his friend Freep return home into space. Now it was his turn to go. There was much work to do. He had many more deliveries to make before two. So he grabbed hold of the reins, to his team made a great cry, and away they all flew into the starry night sky. And he knew just what to say to end this tale right. Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night.